what you may or may not know about the world of digital marketing right now is is it's a it's kind of a different world completely every couple of years. And and what that means is it's a really great place to break into business if you're pretty young, because you in a few years could be the best in the world at it better than people that have been doing it for for 20 years, because what they were doing for the first 18 of their 20 years was a different thing than what it is right now. So if you're a real estate investor and are wondering how to raise and leverage private money to make more profit on every deal, then you're in the right place. On Raising Private Money, we'll speak with new and seasoned investors to dissect their deals and extract the best tips and strategies to help you get the money, because the money comes first. Now here's your host, Jay Connor. Welcome to another amazing episode of Raising Private Money. I'm Jay Connor, your host, and this is the podcast where we talk about how to raise private money without ever asking for money. Well, you know, the two biggest questions that I get from real estate investors, particularly new ones or seasoned real estate investors is, first of all, where do I get the money? And secondly, well, how do I find the deals? Where are the motivated sellers, particularly when there's nothing in the multiple listing service? Well, we're going to answer that second question on today's show is where in the world, and particularly in this market, can you find motivated sellers that are off market and don't have their houses in the multiple listing service when, first of all, there's hardly any inventory out there? Well, I have got a good friend, fellow mastermind member and expert on how to find these motivated sellers on the show today as my guest. He is actually the founder of Bateman Collective, which specializes in online motivated seller lead generation. And he and his team do it through PPC. They do it through SEO, search engine optimization, and also Facebook ads. Well, he and his team, listen to this, generates over $50 million in wholesale assignment fees for over 150 real estate investment companies each year. In just a moment, you're going to meet my good friend and motivated seller expert finder, Mr. Brandon Bateman, right after this. Well, Brandon, welcome to the show. Yeah, thank you, Jay. I'm super excited to be here. Got to say, I can't bring the energy like you do, but happy to be here anyways. Well, hey, look, I'm not worried about the energy. If you can bring the deals, then that's all we care about is you bring in the deals, man. And you know, as I said in the intro, that's one of the two most common questions I get. Where do you get the money? I got the answer to that without relying on banks and institutions and hard money. And the other question you've got the answer to, and that is how do you find these motivated sellers? And, and I'm telling you, I'm just so excited to dive in. Um, so we're going to unpack your strategies, how you find these people and all that kind of good stuff. Um, so first of all, Brandon, how are you qualified to even do what you do? You know, to be honest, Jay, I don't know that anybody's ever asked me that question. How am I qualified to do what I do? How did you get good at it? I mean, you're finding yeah, motivated sellers. I mean, $50 million in assignment fees that you provided. I mean, obviously, you got a large client base of wholesalers, um, you know, with the assignment fees. But uh, how did you get started doing this? And how did you get so good at it? I mean, that's a lot of activity and a lot of business. Yeah, it's a good question. I'm a pretty young guy. Um, I, I started this business actually when I was in college um, because I was really passionate about marketing and just wanted to learn more about that. And and uh, kind of in this, you, you, what you may or may not know about the world of digital marketing right now is is it's a it's kind of a different world completely every couple of years. And and what that means is it's a really great place to break into business if you're pretty young because you in a few years could be the best in the world at it better than people that have been doing it for, for 20 years, because what they were doing for the first 18 of their 20 years was a different thing than what it is right now. So anyways, that, that considered, that's, that's kind of why I was pretty passionate about digital marketing. Um, one of the first clients that I ever got was a real estate investor. Um, they had worked with a bunch of different agencies and just weren't able to make, um, in this case, Google PPC was the marketing channel. They just couldn't make it work. Um, and we, 
were able to uh, double their revenue in the first year without any more ad spend. The second year, we doubled the revenue again without any more ad spend. And then the third year, we doubled the ad spend and, and doubled the revenue um, and got them to over a million dollars from the single marketing channel in their in their wholesale business, which together with their other marketing channels uh, made, it, uh, made it a pretty good wholesaling business. So that was kind of my introduction to real estate. And that, uh, that story starts about six and a half years ago. Um, at this point, Bateman Collective has been focused just on working with real estate investors for about the past three years. And it's all we do all day, every day. I've got about 30, um, 30 team members that, that uh, support these campaigns and work with our clients. And uh, our goal is basically to be the best in the world at this one niche form of marketing. And it's pretty fun. Wow. So um, break down for us. Um, and I mentioned it briefly in the intro, but the different kinds of digital marketing that you do for real estate investors and how are they different? How are the channels different? Yeah, good, good question. So there, there are a few, a few different channels that we use. Um, I would, I would categorize them into two different buckets. Um, the first one being search marketing and then the second one being social. Um, and this is, I guess, b before I even get too much into how these channels are different from each other, it's, it's worth noting how they're different from other channels that you're probably familiar with, because the big channels, uh, when it comes to direct to seller marketing, are going to be direct mail, cold calling, texting, um, all that kind of stuff. So what makes these channels primarily different is that they don't start with a list. In cold call, texting, direct mail, those you basically have a list of properties that you're looking for, and then you're going to target people based on that. When it comes to online marketing, we're going to target based on all kinds of different criteria, including mostly online behavior and intent. Um, and that's what makes it really, really fascinating. Um, the first channels that I mentioned, search marketing channels, the, the really cool thing about this is that you can target people based on what they actually intend to do. Because what someone types into Google says a lot about the future, what they're likely to do. Like uh, you and I met in Tampa. If I were to type into Google flights from Salt Lake City to Tampa, it's pretty likely that I'm going to end up flying to Tampa pretty soon, right? And those are things that Google knows. And, and this behavioral data or this intent data is so much more predictive of someone's behavior um, than just the fact that they're on some list. So, so that's kind of the, the unique thing about this. Um, the other thing that's unique about it is these people are going directly to you. You know, it's like as if you were doing direct mail and they were just going to their special mailbox where they just had postcards from people that want to buy their house, just looking and hoping that they could find someone to buy their house. Right. So that's that's the thing that's pretty exciting about this. Um, so so if I were to just describe each of the channels briefly, if we have search marketing, we kind of break that out into two specific channels. Let's just say someone types into Google at the top of the page on Google, you're going to find paid ads. That's what we're going to, that's what we call PPC marketing. Um, and that's a paid way to win on Google. It's like a light switch. You turn it on, you turn it off, you pay your way to the top and you get leads. Below that are organic results. Those are organic results. You kind of have to earn your way there. So you can get the same kind of leads you get from paid ads on Google, but it's a much slower ramp up and long term, it tends to be a lot more cost efficient to kind of earn your way there by basically convincing Google that you deserve to be there. So, so that's the discipline of search engine optimization. So there between PPC and SEO, you have the same types of leads, but for PPC, you have to pay for them. And then for SEO, you kind of have to earn your way to get those leads. And then the final channel is just paid ads through Facebook, which is a little bit different. It's a little bit more comparable to something like TV advertising, for example, where you're reaching a really broad audience. Um, and the reality is it is more targeted than that, but, but still you're reaching someone with, with online ads. Um, and, and really all, all three of the channels work. Uh, people ask me which one has the best return on investment. It's going to be SEO. Um, but what has, uh, you know, what in the first year, what would have the best return on investment? That's going to be either PPC or Facebook ads. Facebook does it through a bit of a lower lead quality, but also lead, lower lead cost versus Google PPC is going to be your faster cash conversion cycle, a little bit more scalable um, and a little bit quicker to work than, than SEO. So that's the, a, a quick breakdown of the different channels. Sure. And your company, Bateman Collective, that you founded, is when the, the services that you provide that you're talking about, is it like completely done for you to where the real estate investor just tells you and your team what they want and then you all make it happen or what's on the side of the real estate investor as far as their involvement? Yeah. Yeah. I can, I can describe like kind of where we, where we end and where the real estate investor starts. 
Um, we kind of cover everything up to the point that the lead is generated. So that means that we're creating ad creatives, we're managing all the targeting, we're managing the budgets, um, we're managing the optimization of the campaigns, we're managing the, the landing page that the ads go to that generate the lead, the tracking, all that kind of stuff. As soon as the lead is generated, that's where it becomes the responsibility of our client, where they have to call the lead, text the lead, email the lead, whatever it takes to, to get in touch with them and try to negotiate and purchase the house. So that, that's kind of the, the delineation. The only other thing that we ask of our clients, and this is kind of unique of us, but it is part of what makes us really good at what we do, um, is we do put all the leads that we generate for our clients into a database. And we ask that they give us feedback on those leads as to how good they were and how far they progressed into their sales funnel. And then we use that data to optimize the campaign so we can generate more of the highest quality leads. Um, and that's that's a little bit more work for, for the client, but what it does for us is it allows our, us to hold our team internally accountable to the results for our clients. And it allows us to train Google on exactly what types of leads we're looking for so that we can optimize for not just the number of leads, but also for the quality of leads, um, which is the reason that most people, when they've been working with a different company and they switch to working with us, they find that their number of leads often will go down, but their quality of lead will go up such that they're doing more deals from less leads. Well, you know, that's what it all matters. That's what, it, what matters. I mean, you, know, you know, hear people talk about, well, what's the cost of your lead? What's the cost of the lead? That's important to know, but it's exponentially, in my experience, more important to know what's the cost of your conversion? What's the cost? How much are you paying to get that deal? Now, of course, that's assuming that you and your team, not you, Brandon, but the real estate investor knows how to convert a lead <laughs> and, yep. and, and take that lead down. Um, so you, you mentioned that, of course, with Google or um, now, is it, is, it, is it Google primarily that you do uh, PPC or do you do other search engines as well? Well, there's only in, in the world of PPC, there's only kind of two platforms that matter. There's going to be Google, um, which is the biggest one. And then we have Microsoft, which has a variety of other search engines like Bing, Yahoo, DuckDuckGo, um, all kind of fall under that umbrella. We do both, although it's, it's worth saying that Google's definitely where there's more business. Um, the advantage of Microsoft is sometimes that it can be cheap, but really low volume. Got you. Well, since you've got so many clients, uh, 150 different real estate investing companies, um, you know, that are using your service, have you done any kind of uh, analytics or any kind of data? And my guess is you being a, a numbers guy and a digital marketing guy, you probably have. Um, do you have a sense as to across the board, how many Facebook ads uh, leads have you got to get to convert a, a deal? And of course that's going to vary with the operators. Uh, but mm -hmm. generally speaking, how many Facebook ad leads have you got to get versus say a, a Google lead? Cause you know, Google leads, they're searching for us. What are you, what, yeah. what kind of feedback are you getting on that? Yeah. Fa fantastic question. And, and we ironically do have all the data because we, uh, because we gather that to help optimize the campaigns. And I can paint a little bit of a picture for you of lead quality. Um, Cause when we talk about quality of lead, a lot of people just don't know what that means. Um, so the, the first thing I can talk about is the number of leads per contract on Google versus Facebook. Um, Facebook's just slightly higher. Google's about 15.5 leads per contract. Facebook, um, by our newest benchmarks, which aren't even published yet, ironically, I just got this data barely, um, is close to about 18 leads per contract. So oh, you I, see thought, 15... I thought it would have been, um, I thought it would have been more different than that. And a lot of people think it's going to be a lot more different than that. And, and the reality is Facebook has a bad reputation in this industry, but people blame the channel when the reality is the strategy is to blame for the lead quality generally on Facebook. Basically with Facebook, there are ways to get good lead quality. You just have to, you just have to manage it properly. Um, we actually did a whole master series on our podcast just about this. So if anybody wants to look at that, it's just, you can go to podcast.batemancollective.com um, and you'll see that we had a, it's a three-part series called the Facebook as masterclass that was published probably a month or two ago where we talk about some of the strategies that we use. Um, but yeah, the, the reality is that's not like how Facebook necessarily works as a channel. If you just go onto Facebook and you run ads more likely than not, you'll, you'll end up with 50 or 60 leads per contract. Um, but if you do the right, the right management techniques, and that has to do with like the way that you're targeting the ads, the way that the creative is optimized, the, 
the um, landing page and the form structure and things like that. You do all that right, then you can increase the lead quality. Interesting. Interesting. Yeah, you're the first person I've heard talk about. And of course, it makes sense that in words, you just don't want to throw an ad up there and think that's going to work. Right. Um, and of course, you've got you've got years of well, you've been doing exclusively for real estate investing for the past three years. So you've got a lot of data. So does the way so what is and I know this is a loaded question because it's going to depend on the market. It's going to depend on the operator. A lot of depends, but what is like a beginning out of all your clients? What's like a beginning budget or monthly budget that someone really needs to think about having in place for them to really, you know, be able to take advantage and optimize um, your, your company services? Yeah, great, great question. I, I love loaded questions. I'll never be able to answer them perfectly, but you know, that's the stuff that everybody cares about, right? So um, as it as it relates to budget, there's there's a few things to think about. Um, a lot of people put budget in terms of a monthly budget. Um, I like to think of it in terms of like budget to get a campaign started, um, which includes a monthly budget, but it, the other factor there is how long are you going to do it? Um, because your budget has a lot to do with... Um, with how long it takes for the campaigns to optimize and how long it's going to take for you to get enough data to know how the channel works. Um, so, so the first thing, even before we get into monthly budget numbers, my recommendation is always to give the channel about six months of runway so that you can actually understand how it works. And if I could choose between a large budget spent over like one, two or three months versus a smaller or medium budget spent over six months, I would always choose the six month time frame. Um, because sometimes it takes more time than it does money to figure things out. Um, of course, both of those are factors and the more budget, the, the, the quicker you can optimize. Um, so that's the first thing that we want to think about is whatever number we choose has to be sustainable for about six months. And you don't want to be the guy that's like out of money tomorrow and can't sustain the campaigns. The second thing to think about is your market. If you're in a really small market, like Jay, I know you're in a market of 40,000 people. Um, the reality is I, I just wouldn't do PPC in a market like that. Usually we're looking for 250,000 people, at least ideally more than 500,000 people in a market. But if you're in a market of 9 million people versus a market of 500,000 people, there's going to be different caps and how much budget you can spend. And you don't want to just inflate your ad costs by coming in super hot with a high budget, with a high diminishing return. So this is something where I can't give you precise advice now. But it is worth talking to somebody who knows what they're talking about and can kind of help you through the process of deciding the budget. And then the last thing that you want to think about is in terms of a, a minimum budget. Usually, most of our clients are starting out somewhere between $5,000 and $15,000 a month in total cost um, of the campaign. We do have some clients going as low as about $3,250 a month. And of course, we have clients into the six figures, although it's rare that they start there. More commonly, they'll start more in the five to fifteen thousand dollar a month range and then they'll ramp up to there over time so the I guess, I guess what i'm saying there is if you're too too low on budget it can be a little bit cost prohibitive um specifically for for google ppc which is the number one channel that our clients start with um and i'd say starting at about 30 to 50 a month multiplied by six months that's where you might be in business but plan for somewhere between five and 15 in most markets Okay. So when, when a client is investing with you to get these leads, um, are, are they getting all the services that you offer or are they, are they picking and choosing? Like, are they, are, are they getting the Facebook? Are they getting the Google? Are they getting, you know, the SEO? Are they getting everything? They, it, it totally depends on the client. And generally what we'll do is we will make a recommendation based on what budget they do have available. Um, and also based on what goals they have, like, like, let's just say I'm talking to you, Jay, and ask like, what is success in this campaign? You say success is that I get a deal a month over the next six months. I'm not going to recommend SEO because that's not going to happen on SEO, right? SEO is a long-term game where you're going to do awesome year two, but you might not do as well year one, right? So let's just say we're talking SEO. I want to make sure that you understand what game we're playing because the worst thing you can do for SEO is invest the money into it. And then before it starts working, end up quitting. So you never actually get anything from it, right? So, so when we're talking SEO, that's, that's a different conversation. If we're talking between Google and Facebook ads, we love to do both together. And, and actually, if you, if you look at the way our pricing structured, we don't charge a lot more to add to the second channel 
it's pretty it's pretty cost efficient. But we like to do that because sometimes in, in a certain market, one of them outperforms the other by a decent margin. And it's it's not uh, it's not perfectly easy to predict which one that's going to be. So having both channels allows us to have a little bit more of a diversified approach. And then it's not uncommon that we'll end up cutting one of those at some point to just double down on the other one that's working better for us. So that's that's a common strategy. Although if you have just a minimum budget, then usually we're just going to choose one channel and go all in versus trying to split across multiple. Right. Well, it makes total sense because you're not going to know which one to ramp up and which one to tone down until you've got the data on both Facebook and, and, you know, the search engines. It's like, you're sort of like th throw, throwing, an, you know, firing a, a gun in, in midair with no target. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 100%. Yeah, and we're, we're super data driven. So so that's always the goal. And the goal always is to know even before we start where our money's going to be well spent. But this is this is marketing and any marketer that tells you that they know how a campaign's going to perform before they actually run it and see the data is just lying through their teeth. You, you just you don't know. It, it's it, it's still unpredictable as much as people want to look at me and say, like, you've done this so much for so many companies, you must have like some predictable solution where you just do this and you know, it's going to work. It's, it's not true. It's, in fact, doing this for this long, for this many companies has taught me the opposite. At the beginning, I thought like you have, you know, you do a campaign five times and it works really well. And you think, you know what you're doing until you work with enough companies and enough markets, you learn how little you actually know about what's going to work. And real marketers are just curious people that are really eager to figure it out. Now I know why I'm a marketer. <laughs> <laughs> there you I go. have, I have unsatiable, uh, curiosity, just like a child. Um, now, you know, there's, there's, there's pay per click and there's pay per lead and different companies, you know, do it different ways. So, um, is your client paying like per lead that's coming in or is there a marketing budget and whatever you get is what you get. Um, how does that work? Yeah, there is a marketing budget and whatever you get is what you get. You could spend 10 grand and get zero leads and you've officially spent 10 grand and got nothing, or you could get infinity leads and you're not going to get billed anymore for your infinite number of leads. Right. So that's, it, it's a little bit of a, of a different model than a paper lead model. Um, ironically, I'm glad you bring this up because paper lead and paper click could get like put together for some reason. Yeah. yeah they're, they're very different. Yeah. Explain the difference know. between PPC and paper lead. It's, it's the same difference as there is between direct mail and paper lead or text messaging and paper lead. Like paper leads, a method of buying leads. It's not a marketing channel. A lot of people think it's a marketing channel when the reality is those paper lead companies are doing marketing to sell you those leads and whatever marketing they're using, that's ultimately the channel that you're, that you're utilizing. You're just buying it on a per lead basis instead of buying the raw marketing. Um, like instead of, you know, paying 40 cents per postcard to send a bunch of postcards out. You're just, someone else is doing that. And then you're just paying them when they get a response from those postcards. It's the same deal. So for some reason, PPC and paper lead kind of get put in this group together when really they're, they're no more similar than, than any other marketing channel on paper lead. Um, but yeah, paper lead as, as for its, its viability as a marketing channel, it, it could be great. It could be bad. A lot of people have um, very mixed results with it. And that's because the lead quality is really mixed because paper lead companies generally will do a lot of different marketing channels and they will change those over time. And, and, you know, so things could be going great and then, and then they change their marketing channel and then suddenly things aren't going as great for you or, or something like that. So they're, they're, they're both viable options. Although paper lead is uh, it is a common way for people to get into um, more of an inbound lead gen type of channel without having the kind of commitment that I'm talking about with like six months and a pretty consistent budget, you know, you could just buy even sometimes a single lead if you want to. Um, although I, I would argue that the fact that it doesn't need, like you're not forced to be consistent doesn't mean that you shouldn't be equally as consistent as you would be with PPC. It's just a, it's just a different channel. So anyways, I, I, uh, a lot of people have success with paper lead. A lot of people hate paper lead. Um, and I would kind of consider them as different channels. The advantage to PPC though, is that you do own your, uh, you own all your data and you own your strategy and you can adapt that versus paper lead. You kind of get what you get. Um, so I'd be, I'd be nervous to have a business based on paper lead, but it, I think it could be an excellent supplemental channel. Gotcha. So with the PPC, you and your team are managing the client's Google account. 
uh, and you're managing, you know, getting the ads done for them. So for your client, are you also um, helping brand them since it's their own uh, pay-per-click account? Absolutely. Yeah. Whatever their company name is, people will be going to that company's website. They will be interacting with it. They will be reaching out to that company and then you're going to be calling them later from that company. Um, this actually builds your brand. So, so paper lead is very much just like a quick hit, but not a great long-term strategy versus PPC is more of your midterm strategy and SEO is more of your long-term strategy. Um, and they all have their place, right? Like if you need revenue today, then, then a channel that involves some ramp up might not be the best fit for you. Um, but most more seasoned companies are doing their own marketing under their own brand. Um, it's, it has every advantage other than the fact that it's just not like a quick hit. Like you just buy a lead right now. Yeah. I love that. And I want, I want my audience to understand that difference with, um, pay per lead all the branding is whatever, whoever the company is that you're paying the money to. Now you're getting the lead, but the uh, prospect is going to their website and filling in the information. As you just described, um, the difference there, Brandon, on PPC is it's your company that's being marketed. And the beautiful thing, it's your team that is, you know, handling all that, um, you know, from, from start to finish. And the thing of it is, you know, and unless the real estate investor, I mean, knows digital marketing like you and your team, then I don't think most people are going to even have hardly any success with trying to do their own PPC. I mean, my guess is you've probably had some clients that have come to you that tried to do their own PPC and were not successful with it. Yeah, it, it definitely, it definitely happens. Um, and we've even had clients work with us and then go leave and do their own thing and then come back. Um, I've seen people do, do well on their own PPC. I mean, it really comes down to what, what is your value as a business owner? And if your number one contribution to the business is that you are capable of running a technical campaign on a platform for one of your marketing channels, uh, then I think your vision of the company is far too small. <laughs> everybody has their own, you know, place they want to be. But uh, I guess, I guess what I've seen, I've even seen it happen with some people where they're like, Oh, the way to get to the next level is to learn to do my own PPC. And then they learn it. And then their company does get to the next level. And then at that level, they're like, okay, now to get to the next level, I just have to hire an agency anyways, <laughs> because that's how you, you know, that's how you grow. Or they have this, this idea of like hiring someone in house to do it as if you're going to find awesome PPC talent that wants to work for you like the real estate investment company that wants to spend 10 grand a month on PPC, like, like no, no great, no great talent in this industry wants to work. And that that's like the least job security anybody's ever had in any job in the history of the world would be an in-house PPC manager for a, for a real estate investment company. So, and, and not, not tons of like learning or growth opportunity either. So, so I guess, I guess what I'm saying is, yeah, it, it is viable. And I know people that do their own PPC and do it successfully. Um, it takes a certain type of person. And uh, if, if you are that person, then, great. Um, and if it works for you, you'll probably end up delegating it at some point anyways. Uh, I'm, I'm a firm believer that a business owner should try to do as little as possible from a working in the business type of standpoint. Um, and I would not call managing a PPC campaign to be working on the business. <laughs> no, that's <laughs> definitely working in the business for sure. Okay. Yeah. I yeah. mean, doing your own PPC and your own digital marketing campaigns, is like rehabbing your own single family houses that you're going to flip. I mean, Brandon, I, I had someone, uh, I had a real estate investor one time I was speaking at, a, at an event and the, um, the real estate investor says, well, I just love doing my own rehabs. It's like therapy to me. And you know what I said? I said, anybody that does their own rehabs needs therapy. That's what I say. Right. <laughs> I mean, I mean, do That's I, funny. do I, even, do I even look like I know how to hold a hammer? No, I don't know how to hold a hammer. Good night. I'd be hammering my fingers off. I mean, it just comes down to the, to the, to the, to the point, the more you get out of your own way and let people do what they do best. And then you just do what you love to do. Your business will scale and skyrocket. This has been amazing. Brandon, how can the audience get in touch with you and your team and find out what you all could do for them in their market? Yeah. Great question. If, yeah, if anybody has, I mean, all, all those questions, like how many leads could I get? What kind of budget should I have? Um, what markets should I target? All that stuff. 
questions that we get on a daily basis. It's just easier managed on a one by one, like one to one kind of conversation. Um, so if you go to batemancollective.com, you can uh, on there, there's a place where you can reach out to, to my team and schedule a call and kind of talk through some of these questions for your specific scenario. Um, if you're just kind of interested, like if you if you like this flavor of content a little bit and you want to kind of maybe start preparing yourself to be ready to do something like that in the future, I highly recommend our podcast. It's uh, you can find it. at It's called the Collective Clicks podcast. You can find it at podcast.batemancollective.com. Um, and we put a lot of content in there about like strategy. A lot of people don't realize that there's a lot of strategy. Like we have entire episodes dedicated to like how to choose your budget, entire episodes dedicated to like how to figure out what kind of geographic targeting to do for your PPC campaign, you know, all those kinds of things. Uh, highly recommend you check that out so that you can kind of become well-versed in that and know enough as a business owner. There's like a certain amount that you should know to where you can be, you can have productive strategic conversations, um, but not necessarily be in the weeds doing everything. Um, so I highly recommend you check that out. That's awesome. Brandon, this has been fascinating having you on as a guest answering one of the two top questions that all real estate investors have. And uh, you nailed it, Brandon. Thank you so much for joining me. Yep. Thank you, Jay. I appreciate your time. You got it. Well, there you have it. Another amazing episode of Raising Private Money with Jay Connor. I appreciate you enjoying, uh, joining me here on the show. Uh, and something that would just really mean the world to me is if you would share this episode, you know, I don't run any ads on this show. I don't sell anything on this show and we need your help to just spread the word so we can have people keep listening so we can keep having amazing guests like Brandon Bateman. So if you're watching on YouTube, be sure and ring that bell. If you're listening on your favorite podcast channel, be sure and follow so you don't miss out on any more of these amazing episodes. So I look forward to seeing you right here on the next episode of Raising Private Money with Jay Connor. Are you feeling inspired by the knowledge you gained in this episode? Then head over to jayconner.com slash money guide. That's J-C-O-N-N-E-R.com slash money guide and download your free guide that shares seven reasons why private money will skyrocket your real estate investing business right now. Again, that's jconnor.com slash money guide to get your free guide. We'll see you next time on Raising Private Money with Jay Connor.